um, want to say a few things about um, how that uh, book came to be written. Um, then I want to say give you a rough idea of the main thesis in the book. Um, I should make you aware of the fact that I wrote for rockwell.com a description of the book a few months ago, so that uh, I'm sure the users will be able to make that available if you have not seen this. Um, and, um, and lastly, I want to just uh, make a few remarks about what I hope of the book or prospects of, um, of the book. Um, let me start by giving you a little bit background how the book was written. Um, in the late 1980s, and, um, Murray Rothbard and uh, Lou Rockwell um, broke away from the Libertarian Party and uh, for reasons um, it was, uh, foreign policy, it was the cultural leftism of, uh, of the Libertarian Party and so forth, and formed a coalition um, with uh, old-style conservatives, those that are nowadays referred to as the paleo-conservatives, people who were associated with uh, Chronicles magazine uh, and the Rockford Institute. And we had for, uh, from about 1990 on until, I would say, 1996 or so, um, a number of conferences uh, sponsored by either these paleo-conservatives or by uh, the paleo-libertarians, uh, Murray, Murray Rosebarts and uh, Lou's group. Um, and uh, a number of books originated out of these conferences that took place at various places all over the United States. I have been, I was a regular speaker at these, uh, at these conferences and to a certain extent, so to speak, my contribution to this uh, newly created movement is, is contained in, in this book. Um, there were a number of other products coming out of these few years of uh, uh, cooperating with, um, with conservatives, such as, for instance, uh, the Cost of War book, uh, reassessing the presidency uh, uh, book. Um, the, um, this is the book on the session liberty um, and the state. Um, then Murray Rothbard's uh, The Irrepressible uh, Rothbard, uh, which are collecting uh, columns that he wrote for uh, the Triple R, um, which was at, for many years the main outlet for paleo-conservative, paleo-libertarian uh, writers and became, of course, then the forerunner, so to speak, of, uh, of rockwell.com. So some of my articles in earlier versions appeared, for instance, in, um, in the triple R. Um, this coalition somehow broke apart after a number of years, but, mm, but not the spirit of it. Some people uh, remained uh, uh, remain friends um, and, uh, and and still cooperate closely. Another book I should mention uh, that came out of this these ten years of cooperation uh, Paul Gottfried's um, After Liberalism. Um, and um, if I want to describe, so to speak, the objective of my book, uh, then I would say the objective of the book is to uh, yeah, to describe and to create uh, an alliance bet between libertarians and, uh, and conservatives. Um, there are uh, the following theses contained in, uh, in my book. First of all, I try to show that, uh, that we as economists have a great advantage, so to speak, over other people, uh, especially over historians, insofar as we, as we know some theory, and you cannot interpret history without knowing some, uh, some theory. 
Um, let me just give you one example. Um, for example, as an economist, you know that printing money cannot possibly create prosperity. Um, nonetheless, there are numerous historians, for instance, who give you accounts that money was printed and then prosperity broke out. Um, so as an economist, even if it should be true that there was prosperity occurring after money was printed, then you know that prosperity occurred despite the fact that money had been printed, but the printing of money could not possibly be the cause of it. Or take some other... Um, statement that you find frequently mentioned in the press and nonetheless are theoretically nonsense, ridiculous, uh, such as we should, when we are in a recession, then we should consume more instead of saving more. Every normal person knows, of course, if you're in a recession, the way to get out of it is to save more, not to consume more. Um, and again, in historic, historic, historical reports, you frequently read, yeah, there was a stimulus program that uh, make people to consume more and uh, prosperity ensued. Uh, again, an economist would know this is this is a wrong report, even if, so to speak, the facts that they report, the sequence of the events is correct. These things happen because of it or they happen despite of it. And these sorts of questions historians cannot decide. Economists can uh, are far better equipped to handle these, uh, these questions. And then the main thesis are, I try to apply, so to speak, simple economic reasoning uh, to a reinterpretation of, uh, of history. Um, the first thing I try to show there is that the idea to believe in uh, states creating peace um, is obviously a fundamental error. Um, Imagine what work, just consider what the state is. A state is defined, and there's no debate over the definition of this. Uh, the state is defined as being an organization that is the ultimate judge in cases of conflict within a territory. And allegedly, we need a state, because otherwise, if there would not be an ultimate judge, there are conflicts breaking out all the time. Now, what I try to show is to be, if you have a monopolist of uh, ultimate decision-making or ultimate arbitration in a, ter in a territory, this implies, of course, that this ultimate judge also is the judge in all conflicts that the state itself creates. Um, that is, if I hit him on the head as a state uh, and create the conflict, then I'm the judge who determines who is right and who is wrong. Um, so how can you possibly think that an organization that has the right to be the ultimate decision maker will not take advantage of this position and cause deliberately conflict and then rules afterwards in its own favor? Um, that is, they don't create peace, they create war uh, or they create conflict. The second, the second thesis is that that transition in history from monarchical governments, which existed from most of most of human history, to the modern form of majority uh, ruled democracies, that is a transition that began, so to speak, with the French Revolution and was finished roughly after World War One, when practically the entire world turned to the democratic regime. Even those countries that are by name monarchies nowadays, like Great Britain or Sweden or so, are of course, in, in, in all practical effect, uh, not classical monarchies anymore. The monarchs has nothing to say. Uh, they are democracies too. Uh, and I try to show that while the standard interpretation is of course, especially in the United States, that this transition was by and large progress in, in human history. That is, it was great, a great event that we got rid of kings and then uh, had elected officials taking their position. That this thesis is, uh, again, stands in contradiction to some elementary economic uh, reason. Um, again, those institutions are, of course, dangerous. Kings are dangerous in uh, democratic government. Those are states. Uh, but comparatively speaking, monarchies have certain advantages. The advantage that the monarchy as for instance, a monarch takes a long run uh, view of things. Um, 
he owns, so to speak, the country and wants to pass it on to son or daughter, and he will not want to ruin the country. He wants to preserve the value of the country in order to uh, hand it over to the next generation intact. Um, he takes, so to speak, the view of somebody who owns the house um, and, uh, and wants to preserve the value of it in order to give it to the next generation. Um, if you look at monarchy, if you look at democracies where you have rotating rulers, so to speak, they will take the short run. Um, what you don't loot today or in one year or in five years, you will not be able to loot again in, uh, in the future. So you have to loot as fast as, as, fast as possible. Short run, uh, short run orientation. The way I always explain it to my students, imagine, for instance, on the one hand, I give you a house, and you become the owner of the house. And in the other case, I simply appoint you to be the temporary caretaker of the house. But I allow you uh, to get income out of the house and do something with the income that you get out of the house. Will people act differently if they are the owner of the house or if they are the temporary caretaker of the house? And of course, every student immediately recognizes, of course, that makes a tremendous difference. This is precisely the difference of the between democratic rulers and kings. The second point in this, in this connection I point out is that what is normally pointed out as an advantage of democracy, that is, that you have sort of the free entry into the position of the ruler. Everybody can become president. Everybody can become senator. That this is actually, whereas, of course, only the son of the king can become the next king, or the daughter of the king can become the next king. Uh, that this, what is normally pointed out to be an advantage of democracy, turns out to be actually a disadvantage. Um, after all, keep in mind, states are organizations that tax and legislate and take things away. They produce no goods. They produce actually bads. And do you want to have competition in the production of bads? And the answer is, of course, no, we don't want to have competition in the production of bads. I remember Murray always telling me, um, Look, we should be happy that we don't get all the government that we, that we pay for. Um, imagine, imagine, for instance, that, the, that, that we would really have efficient tax collectors. Uh, we found that out to GM or something like this. No, we want them to be uh, inefficient. Uh, in, any, in any case, so what we see then when it comes to open entry into government is what a king can be conceivably a DC person. Um, there's at least no a priori reason why a dog is just born into this position, why he might not be an all right guy. Uh, on the other hand, when it comes to can a democratically elected politician ever be a decent person? And there the answer is quite obvious. No, of course, there is competition in this area. There's competition among bad people. And of course, the worst people will rise to the top inevitably. Um, so what is normally depicted as an advantage of democracy turns out to be a major disadvantage. Uh, you can bet your lives that no decent person can ever be elected to a very high-ranking position. You must constantly lie in and out your, your way in order to uh, attain these, these types of positions. And then the last, uh, the last thesis of, um, of the book is uh, that we can easily imagine um, that the task of enforcing property rights, defending ourselves, and so forth, can be undertaken by private defense agencies, uh, by insurance companies, by a, a panoply of uh, different uh, um, institutions, all of which have to uh, attract clients. None of them can engage in legislation, for instance, that is changing the rules of the game as states do that constantly. None of them could insist that you have to hand over all of your arms and then we will protect you. This is what states do. They say, we protect you, you give us all the arms and then we protect you. Uh, imagine that a private insurance company, for instance, would say, look, we will protect you, but first you give us all of your knives and forks and so forth so we can protect you more efficiently. Uh, that's done work. They, have, they must have a contract um, and, uh, and cannot change the rules of the game uh, 
essay, uh, essay move along. Um, now a few words about what I what I hope of uh, hope of the book. Um, I mean, so far the book has been extremely successful. I um, am quite surprised to be the party of course it's a title, I guess, which was suggested to me by by Lou. I will be kind of thankful for him for his coming up with this great with this great title. Probably uh, misled many people to buy the book who didn't even know what to get. Um, the first edition was already sold out in, in January and, the, and now it came back into the printer since last week. Um, I, can, I can imagine that this book might become some sort of revolutionary tree. If it is combined um, with some more popular writings, and there I have in particular in mind a book by Patrick Buchanan, The Death of the West, uh, which is a very easy book to read. My book is a little bit more difficult to read, and uh, Buchanan's book is, of course, a bestseller. Um, in, in Buchanan's book, he presents a similar thesis to the thesis that you find in my book. What he refers to as the death of the West is um, we have um, uh, declining birth rates in all Western countries, so the below replacement level, and at the same time we have coming into these Western countries uh, yeah, a massive invasion of, of foreigners from third world from third world countries, <coughs> and he predicts uh, quite convincingly um, that. Uh, Within one or two generations, uh, Western civilization will simply die out. Will be taken over by people who do not know what made Western civilization as great as it is. Um, I describe this process as the process of decivilization, uh, and also associated with the growth of the state, with the rise of democracy, um, and so forth. Um, the weakness, I think Buchanan's book is quite excellent in terms of diagnosing the problem. The problem of Buchanan's book is that he does not understand what the cause is and does not know how to get out of, uh, out of this predicament. Um, Pat Buchanan's view is basically um, you can yeah, revive the West um, without changing any of the fundamental institutions that are currently in existence. That if the welfare state remains in existence as it is, all we need to do is elect Pat Buchanan to become the president and then he would <laughs> introduce some fam family policy, just pay people for bringing more children and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, what I point out in, in, in my book is of course this decline of birth rates is a result of having social security, of having all sorts of welfare programs and so forth. The entire social security problems, all of the Medicaid, Medicare, and so forth, all of this stuff uh, destroys individual responsibility. It destroys all institutions that normally handle these types of problems, the family, churches, communities, and so forth. So if you want to bring about what you can and wants to bring about, is a revival of families, and churches, and communities, and so forth, then the welfare state um, must be uh, must be eliminated, and he also does not understand at all that the state itself is so to speak at fault, um, and does not see that if you want to restore families to their traditional role and communities to their uh, traditional role, then this implies by and large that the state has to be dismantled. Look, what you can see is the state has, if you have a monopoly to be you know, the ultimate judge, then you must destroy, so to speak, all intermediate institutions. Because the head of a household is in a way competing, of course, against the claim of the state, I'm the ultimate judge. The head of a church is in a way competing against the state. Um, the head of a community is competing against the claim of the state, I will be the ultimate judge. So states in the course of 
centuries have destroyed all of these institutions, knowing full well that they are, so to speak, dangerous to their own claim in all cases of conflict. I will be the one um, that decides. So states have to be eliminated in a way in order to restore communities, churches, and so forth to their former role, and this will revive the West. So my hope is, in a way, that many of these Buchanan Knights who are excited about this book will come across the last two chapters in Buchanan's book where they find the guy as convincing as he is in this other part, he has no solution, he has no answer to what caused this problem, and that they might stumble across my book. Um, and and this and then through this uh, Buchanan's book might be a catalyst of, of creating some sort of revolutionary movement or counter-revolutionary movement uh, to restore uh, to restore the West. Um, are there signs for this? Yes, I think there are signs for this. If you look at, for instance, uh, the Amazon.com, the the, uh, the author's report who buys what other books, you find that uh, there must have been plenty of people who have already find, found out what I'm just uh, recommending here, that uh, you should read Buchanan's book and you should read mine, uh, and if you have read them both, then you are a potential revolutionary. <laughs> <laughs> So I think 
yes, the American Constitution is, so to speak, a clear error. Uh, and there were people who approved it, who, who knew that when the American Const Constitution were adopted. I mean, after all, there were anti federalists at this time. There were plenty of people who, at that time, realized that the Constitution was a clear error. Well, let's say 51% of people agree with you, some strongly, some just enough to create your system. And then they start trying to flip split out of the way. It doesn't really any system depend on the commitment of the population. Yes. Even your system. Yeah, yeah, yes. Your system can slide back into say a republic and a democracy yeah. and No, you have to you have to you have to of course understand the reasons um, why it happened, what happened. And that you have to be then eternally vigilant. Um, to, what, what I'm suggesting here is, of course, that uh, what should occur is uh, that the regions recede from, from the central state, and in smaller regions, then the likelihood that you, that you have a population that is aware of the problems and it, it remains vigilant is comparatively high. Um, whereas we would be probably naive to assume that for a country of the size of the United States, for instance, that the, that the entire population would be vigilant enough to maintain an order such as this for the entire country. But in small regions, I believe that would clearly be possible by some local elite sort of seeing to it uh, that people don't come forward with democratic demands and so forth. Yeah. Um, I, um, I find, I've read about two-thirds of your book, um, where I have to read other things from my paper. But I found one of the aesthetic ideals in it that you were referring to is almost a feudal order of very small societies. Um, yeah, in a couple of years. Yeah. And we have secession going on in the speak with Scotland and Wales and, and Northumbria and the old set of in the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms and the kind of Isle of Wight. And I can see the vision unfold now. You have the, I'm worried that peace was actually created in the UK, um, or specifically England, I would say, through the imposition of a national government, rather than prior to that, where you have the splitting up of the, of the old set party or the county or whatever, where each could pull the others. So you didn't have the golden age, that I, I, the aesthetic ideal of the golden age of lots of little places ruling with a very clever elite. You have competitive warfare. Almost the opposite conclusion. Again, because at, at this at this point in time of course it's like Europe was composed of large, large numbers of small units, but they did not understand as we understand it now what the advantages are of this type of system. The advantage the advantages are of course that they Small, small places must engage in free trade. They cannot engage in protection, of course. Mm. Um, in small places, you, you cannot blame other people for your errors uh, that you commit. Uh, look at places like Yugoslavia or former Soviet Union. The standard excuse was always is because the Russians are so to speak, the elite. Mm -hmm. That's why things don't work in Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, whatever it is. In Yugoslavia, a lot the evil Serbs are running the central government and they exploit the Croats and the Slovenes and so forth. And there is some truth, some truth in this. Um, if you are a very small unit, the sort of excuse does not work anymore. The, the, the Slovenes now have their own place there and they can no longer blame the Serbs. If things don't work out well, then they must say there must be something wrong with us. We have to learn. Um, so the larger the units are, I think the smaller is the reason to ever identify your own your own errors. The smallest if you come to a small liberal society next to a larger individual society seeks the grand to a small society to a confederation in the sense that they might have that they might have uh, defense alliances or something like that. Yes, of course. Um, if you if you live in the neighborhood of very big states and you are small, you get, you, want, uh, 
you are almost forced to this, uh, have alliances of this kind. But this does not this does not imply that you have to have states for this. I was just wondering if it sounds as if that would take us back to the similar uh, root or cycle of recreating the nation state and all the problems that you have like Again, all, in, in all of this, you have to keep in mind uh, that have we learned something from history, and what we have, or what I try to learn, what we can learn from history. So, be aware that forming states is a thing. So, don't form. Know that small units are advantageous. Don't feel ashamed that you are a small unit, so to speak, as you know, the path of history goes in the, in the direction of more concentration. Uh, as long as you believe that there are these sorts of laws of history that all runs uh, towards the world state, you will not put up any resistance if they try to eliminate your small states. Be proud of the fact that there are, that you live in Monaco or whatever, or Andorra, or uh, Liechtenstein, or Luxembourg, or small places like this. Um, the more people know about this, have learned about this, the less likely it is that these sorts of same mistakes will be repeated. Um, all mistakes can be repeated again if people don't learn. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> you think we're scholars? I know nothing. But it sounds as if you're, you're, you're saying that what we've done in the United States is wrong. And to me, it has, well, if we have taken the country that has made the most progress on the best, and then when there's a whole other world out there with many more problems than we have. Am I hearing this correctly? Um, yes, yes, it is true that the United States uh, is wealthier than, than other states, but uh, what is the reason for, uh, for this? Uh, because in the 19th century, they had extremely, an extremely weak state. They had almost an anarchical system in the 19th century. Um, so we can take United States history in a way as an example to show, yes, if there is less state, uh, if we have more anarchy, if we have uh, the, the Wild West and things like this, crime rates were lower in the Wild West than, uh, than they currently are. Um, so this, the American system has been exported to, to all other uh, places in the meantime. Um, all European countries have a system that is by and large the same sort of system that we have in the United States. Um, and all of them drift, so to speak, in the same direction. How can anybody think that the United States, or the constitution of the United States, was so to speak, a success if you see the outcome of it? The outcome is contradicts entirely what the Constitution was set up to do, or what people claim the Constitution was to do. The state has their own, um, and you could predict that from the outset. If you have an institution like the Supreme Court, what can you predict the Supreme Court will do? You can predict, for instance, that the Supreme Court will have an interest in eliminating as much as possible the power of individual states. Why? Because if you eliminate the power of individual states, that gives more power to those people who serve on the Supreme Court. They just serve their own self-interest. Um, how do you explain, for instance, that whatever Tenth Amendment there, uh, that that is a dead matter? Um, that follows simply from having an institution such as the Supreme Court as you will take advantage of it, and you will, uh, and you will increase the power of the central government. You will increase your own power, and so forth. Um, that's a, another, another another example. If you set up an institution, say, let's say such as a central bank, what can you predict will happen if you set up an institution such as a central bank? Will people then print money? And the answer, of course, they will print money. Uh, for what? So you set up, and the Constitution is the same thing. You set up an you set up apparatus that says there are certain people that can tax others, and there are certain people that can make laws, change laws. So 
wouldn't you then say, yes, of course, these people that are equipped with these powers will, of course, tax, and will, of course, tax more, as much as they can get away with, and they will, of course, make laws, and they will make as many laws as they can get away with, and all of the laws will be written in such a way that it benefits them at the expense of others. Can you not predict this? Does that then follow directly from what the Constitution says? The Constitution says you can tax and you can legislate. A machinery that allows people to do this is, so to speak, a criminal machinery. We have not recognized that from the outset. That's true. There were few people who, whatever, at that time, have the insight that we nowadays do have. But now we have the insights. We see these. We see the experiment has failed. Yeah. Uh, but the part of the Constitution uh, was success in that it took away the power to declare war, took away the power to print money, took away the power to impose internal tariffs and quotas between the state governments. No, but, but even this is not true. As I, you, you look, uh, there are no internal, internal tariffs, that's true, but there are all sorts of business regulations you harmonize, so to speak, the, the entire country now. Uh, and you can, in this way, cause more havoc if, than if you would have internal terrors. Um, right? I mean, this is not, the tariff is not the only problem that you have. It's good that you have no internal But initially, it sort of wiped away the power to the um, But in the same, look, there you see the same sort of thing that goes on in the European community. There, there are no internal tariffs anymore, or at least that's what they say. Um, but, on the other, but on the other hand, of course, what we see is an upward, an upward uh, harmonization of everything. So in one country you have tax A, in another country you have tax B, and if they integrate, then both countries have tax A and tax B. One country regulates the baking industry, and the other one regulates the beer brewing industry, and once you create the European community, they both regulate the baking of bread plus the brewing of beer. Um, so this sort of thing you have in the United States still. But it's almost the definition of the state. It's an institution for the imposition of the will of the strong and the weak. The question is how do you prevent it? I get it. Look, the first, the first insight is what was, you must understand what the state is. In, as soon as people know this, they will be very skeptical about these sorts of people that tell you what is good for you and, uh, and uh, uh, how else can you, yeah, I'm at a loss to say, understanding the nature of it is the first step in, in combating it. Um, Look, states have to rely on other people <coughs> supporting them, uh, executing their will, um, at least not resisting them when they uh, command you to do this or that. If it becomes, so to speak, a general attitude among people to say, these are not people who do good things. These are not people that have to be admired. These are people who are in the business of doing bad things. <clears throat> Almost all politicians have engaged in criminal activities, so to speak, if we just use normal standards of conduct. If we look at them in this way, then I think they will no longer be able to get away with many of the things that they currently do get away. They do get away with many of the things because we, yeah, we admire them. We think, well, we make mistakes sometimes, of course, Every person makes mistakes, but we do not see that making mistakes is sort of speak, inherent in the machinery for which they work. As soon as we recognize this, they will lose most, if not all, of their power instantly and can no longer just tell us do this and do that because people will laugh in their face. What are you telling me? <coughs> I, uh, I think we should... Uh, up for a moment, and, um, and I would invite uh, Roger and, uh, and Tom to come back too, so we can just uh, have questions also relating to the other presentation. Is that all right? Is that all right?